Can I welcome everybody? Um, I'm Samantha Rayner. I'm the general editor for this series um, of Elements with Cambridge University Press on publishing and book culture. And I'm delighted to be able to be here for the book launch of the very first um, title in the digital literary culture um, gathering, as we're calling it. So the series is divided into substrands to do with subject areas. And the network turn is the very first one that we're launching um, within this thread. And I'm very pleased to say that when I talked to Bethany Thomas from CUP last week, it's already charging up the charts in terms of downloads with 1,119 downloads as of last week, which puts it at number five out of all the titles that we've published so far on the series, which considering it's not been out for very long, is just amazing. So congratulations to all the authors already <laughs> for such a phenomenal achievement. Um, and I uh, can't wait to see what, it's, it, what it does next. It's a, it is a fantastic little book. I'm sure those of you that have already read it um, know that already. Um, so what I want to do now is hand you over to Laura Dietz, who is the editor for this particular strand, um, so that she can talk you through a little bit more about the collaboration behind it. So Laura, I'm handing over to you now. Sam, thank you. Um, contributing on the editorial team for this book has been joyful for many reasons. It's an exciting book but it's exciting for what has become, but also for how it got there uh, and for its genesis as a work of co-authorship. As the authors, and it is the authors, put it in their introduction, it's the product of a collaboration between a scholar of English literature, book history, and digital methods, a physicist specializing in network science, a historian of science concentrating in digital humanities, and a digital research architect with a background in design and tool development, working together in a way that remains relatively rare for the arts and humanities. The network turn will be influential for many reasons. Um, as Sam has said, the number of downloads speaks to that, but it will also be influential as a model for co-authorship across disciplinary boundaries and a stunning demonstration of what can be achieved. And from there, um, if I could hand off to Joe. Very good. Welcome, everybody. I'm Joe Gouldy. Zoe? And I'm Zoe LeBlanc. <laughs> Zoe is a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Digital Humanities at Princeton University. She is a freshly minted PhD from Vanderbilt's history department in 2019. And she's a specialist in post-coloniality. She's going to be working with me today as the co-host introducing this book and we'll say a couple of words about what we loved but to introduce her a little bit more Zoe's dissertation was entitled Circulating Anti-Colonial Cairo Decolonizing Information and Constructing the Third World in Egypt 1952 to 1966 and she's currently revising it for digital publication. Her work bridges digital methodologies and post-coloniality so she's a wonderful person for me to talk to about what we loved about this book and what you might like about this book. In the fall of 2021, she'll be joining the School of Information Sciences at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign as associate professor of the digital, assistant professor of the digital humanities. Sorry, I want to promote her already. Uh, thank you, Joe. I'm blushing so much. And I feel like you need no introduction. Everybody knows who Joe Goldie is, but I have the honor of doing that as well. Um, Joe is a professor of history and data science at Southern Methodist University, a very rare combination. Um, she is the PI of a 1 million NSF grant called the Unaffordable World. Um, she's also wearing many hats as an external faculty at the University of Chicago, um, a fellow at the Radical Exchange Foundation and the Santa Fe's Institute of Knowledge Lab. And her next monograph, which I'm super excited for, is gonna be a survey of global land redistribution in the 20th century that's coming out uh, kind of a year from now with Yale University Press. Um, so we're gonna be your co-host today and we have the absolute honor of celebrating this book. Um, Laura's already kind of given you a little snippet of who these authors are. So we're gonna leave you to guess who goes with which description um, that she already offered us. Um, but to start us off, I'm gonna introduce uh, Sebastian, uh, who is a lecturer at the University of Cambridge and a senior fellow at the Turing Institute. Um, He's a physicist by background, uh, now in chemical engineering and biotechnology. And I think I'm only scratching the surface of your research interests there. Um, but yeah, Joe, do you wanna share who else we have? 
So in the camera sitting next to Sebastian is Ruth Annert uh, as living proof of their collaboration. There they are together. She is professor of literary history and the Digi digital humanities at the School of English and Drama at the University of Queen Mary London. And she leads a very large research project at the Turing Institute. Um, so next we have uh, Scott who has uh, let me introduce some very exciting um, uh, kind of professional news. He is about to be the incoming director at the Novari Family Research Center at the University of Notre Dame and is a historian of science. And our last author is Nicole Coleman, who is digital research architect for the Stanford Libraries research and research director for the Humanities Plus Design at SESTA, which is one of the foremost institutes in the digital humanities and research. Uh, so Zoe is going to give an initial summary of the book. Zoe, what did you find in this book? Oh man, um, I want to show off the book briefly. Hopefully Zoom doesn't cut it out here. Um, it's a very slim book, but I think this is going to be a book that's going to be extremely generative for many fields, pretty much assigned immediately to many syllabi and really a touchstone for like lots of exciting future research. And again, this is a very slim book. So you're probably wondering exactly uh, how this is possible. So it's very small font size, it's not, um, but it has um, a really kind of, uh, intellectual heft, I would say. And the thing that stands out to me right away is in the introduction, it starts in a kind of um, well-known territory somewhat uh, by talking about the work of Alberto Barabasi, who is kind of one of the founders of modern network science, but juxtaposing his work um, with the work of Mark Lombardi, who was an artist working at the same time studying the kind of history of Saudi funded terrorist networks using index cards and hand-drawn networks. And I really love this juxtaposition because initially it feels quite strange, but it's clearly intentional by the authors of having an artist and a scientist together. And I think really highlights the kind of core argument of this book, which is that for us to understand the network turn, we can't see it as simply a one-way flow from the kind of sciences or computer sciences into the arts and humanities, but really kind of this multiple converging threads um, and a breaking down of binaries between arts, sciences, and humanities. Um, and what I love, love, love about this is not that it's the first to call for kind of interdisciplinary collaboration, but that it's really, I think, one of the first to kind of embody this call in an almost meta sense, right? Because we have four different authors from really diverse kind of disciplinary backgrounds <laughs> Um, who are being very intentional. This isn't a how-to tutorial book. This isn't a series of case studies, though I would probably love that as well if they decided to do a follow-up book. Um, but this is really kind of what they describe as a space for exchange between the disciplines and really a series of provocations for thinking about the networks um, and networks kind of broadly. And so there's so much in here that I could talk about that I loved, but to answer your question, Joe, because I'm already gonna gush for way too long. Um, as a historian, I particularly loved um, the ways in which they kind of historicize the network turn. Um, they, they don't offer a definitive history, but they really kind of are wide ranging in the examples they bring together. Um, and I think it's a really important corrective for us to stop thinking about networks as purely a modern thing. Um, but really kind of something that has a much longer and contested history. Um, and this, I think, gets to their kind of breaking down the barriers because they're not just speaking to humanists here. They're speaking to kind of a wide range of disciplines, um, many of which kind of treat networks as beginning with Facebook, right? There's a much longer history here. Um, and so I think, you know, they really answer this question of why we should all care about this network turn. Um, and it's because we're all in it and it has this longer history and we have to engage with it, whether, whether we want to or not, right? It's ordering our world. Um, and they could have stopped here, right? That's already enough for probably like a whole research agenda. But what I love is they actually go further to kind of talk about how can researchers undertake this type of research, right? They actually dig into that work and join it, not only with thinking about it intellectually, but actually the practice of it. And this is, you know, as a digital humanist, which I also am as well, uh, this is a really exciting section. It, it really kind of talks to a lot of the ways in which uh, digital humanities can bring together this interdisciplinary space. And I love, they, they share a lot of behind the scenes kind of look into the research, even though they're all coming from very kind of diverse backgrounds, 
they've actually all worked on similar subject areas. And I think that's a really special and kind of unique framing. And this is kind of correspondence networks. And I think this is really helpful because it helps them talk to a lot of the critiques this work has had. And this is another thing I love. They don't shy away from the controversy. They're willing to kind of confront it head on. And this is questions of how we use prediction. How do we account for bias? How do we handle incomplete data? And, and they rightfully point out, this isn't just questions in DH or the humanities. These are questions that all scholars are dealing with today. Um, and I, I wanna wrap up quickly so we can get to the things uh, that you loved as well, Joe, but I, I also worked as a DH developer and I, I particularly love that they spent some time talking about two of the most common network analysis tools, Palladio and Gephi, but did so in a way that was really about how the kind of interpretive choices shape these tools and how in turn they shape the types of kind of cognitive modeling that we can do when using them. Um, yeah, why don't I pause there and let you kind of jump in, Joe, because there's so much I could keep going on. There's a whole final section too that I just absolutely loved. But yeah, what did you love, Joe? There's a lot to praise. I, I, I want to agree with you. This is a very responsible book. So those of us who have been uh, who have been beating the drum of digital humanities for a while have long been talking about the promise of these tools to create new forms of research. But some of the critical thinkers in the humanities have resisted this discourse. And what they resist, you know, they resist for good reasons. You might have this readers, you might have this resistance, you might know other people who are concerned that humanities critical thinking habits might be diluted if we don't question our algorithms or question where forms of knowledge come from. So this is a book that's an introduction to network that takes that very seriously. So here we have in the first pages of the book, we have this beautiful illustration of a tree of knowledge, which the authors are taking as uh, an alternative earlier metaphor of the network, um, which represents the same thing as a network. It's how humans share information. And so they, they take this ancient form an image of representation of where knowledge came from that dominated uh, discourse in early modern Europe to at least the 19th century. And then they propose network, uh, network analysis as a situated form that came out of the information age to capture some of the same things that we used to talk about through the tree of knowledge, but with new forms of specificity. And so this allows them to take a um, critical Per discourse studies perspective on the algorithms that they'll present. They've already historicized it and told us where this knowledge came from. And then they arrive at, you know, they introduce network theory, no, no, no former knowledge is needed. And they give an amazing survey, survey of where networks are being deployed today. From food sci science to art history, to the international publishers of modernist poetry, to Catholic conspiracies in Tudor England. They really show off the range of contemporary humanities practice and interdisciplinary engagement where scholars of networks have, have brought these tools to, to bear. So the, I think this is, a, you know, this is the kind of book that I would teach in a freshman seminar on the humanities or on data science or on information or in an English class where I just wanted to touch a tiny taste of what critical readings look like with network tools. It's generous, no prior information is needed, but it takes, it brings in perspectives from information theory, science and technology studies to acquaint somebody with what a network is and what you can do with it. Uh, I also think that the writing of this book, the way that it's produced and the, the territory that it covers is a model of interdisciplinarity. The writers include, these four writers include people who have been building some of the most important tools uh, for analyzing networks from Stanford's libraries, uh, a researcher from physics who's worked in biotechnology and food science, a researcher of, of English literature who's worked on political conspiracies in the past, um, and a historian of science. So we, this, we, we are seeing modeled an interdisciplinary discourse of the kind that the authors are advocating for in the last section of the book, a place in the university where people who do computer science and people who build and people who analyze the past can come together and produce genuinely new knowledge. So read the book, teach the book, it's fantastic. We're gonna be, Zoe and I are gonna be asking some, some general questions about what the book is and where it came from. And uh, we just wanna note that in the sidebar, you'll see that there's a chat 
you can chat with everybody who's listening if you like, but you can also, there's a Q&A box. And if you click on the Q&A box, you can type in your questions. And one of the wonderful things about having the authors here and live is that uh, we can have, we can ask some of those questions live, but there are other questions that the authors may want to respond to in that Q&A box. And so we can field more questions than we would normally be able to in a 90 minute slot. So I'll, I'll pitch the first question for any of the authors who want to respond. Why did you write this book? And who did you write it for? What made you think that the world needed a book about network analysis? Shall I start? This, this was an overflow of too many opinions. <laughs> it, it, it started when um, Seb and I had a fellowship year in Stanford and we got to hang out with Nicole for the whole year. Um, and on Fridays, she often served uh, cocktails in our office and uh, we would end up having our opinions about how you should be using network analysis and how you should, you know, um, what you shouldn't be doing. And um, there were some really productive debates that we had. And uh, there was one like where Seb said, I think we should write some, write some of this down. And then we got to invite um, Scott over for a um, little symposium and we kind of drew him in. So I'll, I'll just hand over the rest of you to say how that developed from there. Well, I, I guess I could say something, but I, I wasn't, I had to be convinced, I think by, <laughs> by Ruth and Seb um, that, that this was in fact a good idea because, you know, as we had, initially talked about it as a sort of um, manifesto. And uh, I, I think we're, where we finally arrive through our many, many conversations um, is exactly the, the right place. It's you know, a book uh, that, um, that gives some history and context um, and some really concrete examples, but really is, designed as a, as, as a provocation to continue the conversation and um, make this available as teaching tool. And I, Scott and I both noticed, um, because I guess, you know, when, when the book was shipped to us, uh, it, it, it shrank uh, in, in transit. And so it's very tiny, but it's the perfect size to fit, you know, in, in your pocket if you're in the U.S. next to your U.S. Constitution. Um, <laughs> I think it's a great, uh, 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 I think it turned out to be a really, really wonderful, I hope it will be a really wonderful book to teach from. And um, so I'm so pleased. I just want to build off of uh, what Nicole said. You know, there's, there's plenty of work out there that uh, justifiably um, critiques networks and network science and the humanities or in the sciences. And I, I suspect uh, the four of us as authors, not I suspect, I know the four of us as authors uh, sitting in pubs or cafes have fetched about bad network science and people doing things poorly. But that's, um, those, are, those are a dime a dozen. They're, they're justifiable critiques. But I think that, you know, what brings us all together is we do see uh, a valuable future um, in networks and network analysis for the arts, for the humanities, for the sciences, and as a, um, an, an interchange place. Um, and I think what I really appreciated about the process of writing this book with um, Nicole and Ruth and Seb is that we were able to really uh, speak from a place of constructiveness. Um, and uh, that, that's something I find very valuable. And it's a mode that as personally in the, the humanities mode, I'm not able to often write in. Um, and I very much appreciated that. Yeah, I, maybe I can just add, I think um, for, for, I think we, we, we started thinking about this because when we gave talks on our, on our own work um, where we've already sort of started experiencing some of these challenges of collaborating, but also the opportunities. You, you, you do end up explaining the same kinds of, or convincing people in the same kinds of ways in every talk, sort of people start out as skeptics and then you find ways of engaging with, with, with those skeptics. And then you start to see patterns and those patterns were worth writing down, I think, um, or, or to, to, to find a new way of communicating what we do to, and I think our aim was always to communicate primarily with people who aren't convinced yet so <laughs> of, of the merit of the digital methods so I think 
the wonders of maybe like that mm. down in a way. And there was clearly a gap because people were still and still are citing Scott's blog posts from ages ago. Mm. And the fact that, that that's what people have to cite mm. suggested there was a gap in the market. And mm. long may people cite it, but hopefully now there's another venue and... <laughs> Yeah, I love those blog posts. Um, I will always cite them, but yes, more is definitely better. Um, I, you guys have, you know, really kind of optimistically described uh, your collaboration here in a really kind of positive sense, which I, I love so much. But in the book, you also kind of talk about the realities of how difficult this kind of interdisciplinary collaboration is. So I was wondering if you could share with us a bit more of the kind of process of writing this book um, and how you guys developed this kind of really cohesive um, kind of output, even though you are coming from so many different backgrounds, you know, how did you find kind of common language to speak to each other? Um, yeah. Anyone want to go first? The drinks helped. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know that, um, uh, we, I mean, we, we had a, a lot of, of significant back and forth be, be precisely because of the language, right? Because um, these terms don't uh, mean the same thing in, in the different contexts you know, that we use them, you know, whether um, we're talking about um, graphs or a graphical language or, you know, do we, do we, are we talking about networks? Are we explicitly talking about network analysis? Uh, you know, these are different ways of, uh, of framing the issue that um, I think, and I hope end up in this book um, being uh, revealed as kind of a, so hopefully kind of produ productive tension, you know, across, across the book of um, what it means to try to talk about something like networks, you know, um, generally. Um, I mean, you know, we struggled with the fact that uh, uh, even even considering history um, of networks and the use of the term, uh, you know, our own framing of that is going to be fa fairly narrow, you know, defined. But again, at least acknowledging that and recognizing that, and and hope, hoping to to open open up to to a, a broader conversation. Um, speaking, you know, from the place that 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 each of us can speak, and and then um, opening up from there. Sounds like it was a real learning experience for everyone, uh, and it, it evolved. It sounds like it evolved in an informal uh, way. Just the discourses do when people are willing to work on the edge of their their knowledge. Does anyone want to say something about that? I think it takes time to get to a place of consensus or at least productive disagreement. Yeah. So we often had these writing sessions where we would finally be in the same city and we could sit down and write together. And we thought we would just sit down and write. But what we actually did was talk really hard about things that we still disputed or that we thought were productive things that we needed to get our heads around. So I think working at the edge of your discipline takes a long while to learn the language of that other discipline and learn how to have the conversation across that boundary. We also mentioned uh, trading zones in the book. And I think that our particular trading zone is we all happen to be working on early modern correspondence networks, even though we were coming at them from very different angles. Uh, and so we were able to have a, a place to start that conversation. Um, and that allowed us to uh, have, it, have these really um, fruitful discussions and try to realize that we were all coming sort of to the same place with the same terms, but with very different meanings. That's great. Could you, I'm wondering if you could give the listeners some of the taste of the excitement that your book conveys about the discoveries that each of you made as researchers. What was, what was a big finding that you had using network analysis that you couldn't have come about in, uh, in you couldn't have come across in any other way? Should I talk about our spies and conspirators? Mm. Um, Seb and I were sitting in Starbucks of all places um, off the, just off the side of the camp of Stanford campus one day and Seb had generated these graphs that um, charted two different network measures against each other and I was going through working out who everyone was and why they might be distributed in that way and I kept found this bunch of outliers 
And I was like, he's a conspirator. He's a Catholic conspirator. He's a double agent. He's a spy. He's a conspirator. And we had this, we had this realization that these outliers had a kind of profile. And that's when we had, we had this idea how to create a network profile to see if we could cluster people and make predictions about who other spies might be. And that was a really cool uh, breakthrough moment, which turned into an article. So that was, um, I think, our, one of our kind of highlight moments. Do you, want, you have another one for another discipline, probably. Oh, well, I mean, well, I was just gonna say, I mean, yeah, this, this idea of generalizing um, iteratively from, from, you know, you know running, running a fairly simple algorithm getting a historical insight from it, but then translating that back into an improved and more general uh, algorithm. And then sort of, sort of, you know, I, we sort of each get a, a there's a sort of innovative, innovative step on both sides that, that, that sort of, I, I get excited about the algorithm and Luke gets excited about the history. And, and so I think that's a general, uh, that's, that's perhaps a way in which collaboration can work if, if both sides are invested enough in each other's research questions, but also can develop their own research questions as a, as a result of the collaboration. So that's, I think, um, one of the things we sort of learned through this. I, I just want to respond to, to that because I have to say, I bet Scott probably um, it found this to be the case as well, that just having the opportunity to work with Ruth and Seb together um, set the example of, you know, collaborating across disciplines. And <laughs> it was a, it, it, it was a really, really wonderful experience that way um, to, to see how the two of them negotiated um, their, their different perspectives on things and, and really opened, I think, the door for us. Um, in terms of answering about insights, so, you know, for me, my, my role in this was really about conceiving uh, networks as a tool for understanding um, an incomplete historical record. What could that mean? I started this um, within the context of a number of, of researchers in a small case study projects in, um, in the context of mapping the Republic of Letters. And initially, you know, the title of that <laughs> project is mapping because the intention was it was all gonna be about mapping. Uh, and then it became very, very much about networks instead. Uh, and the interesting thing uh, about networks as a um, mode of investigation and a methodological tool, I think is the way that um, it really forces you to deal with the, um, the negative spaces. Uh, and uh, it, it becomes a process of, you know, clustering and classification. These are foundational things of how do we group information? How do we define information? What's in and what's out? And having to struggle with that uh, and come up with your sort of definition of, of terms and categories and so forth is, um, is a parallel part of the project. Uh, and both the, if you're using visualization, the visualization and, uh, and the analysis of those connections um, becomes just a sort of, you know, a supplement in some, in some ways a confirmation, um, but it's always coming back to uh, the accountability that you have to, to make those decisions about what's in and what's out. Uh, and I suppose from my side, uh, in my own historical work, I tend to use and think of networks as um, uh, a substrate of scholarly activity or for scholarly activity. Um, and uh, although I've, I've discovered plenty of things using network analysis, when I say discover, usually it's finding people who I didn't think was import were important, but find dis uh, find that, oh, this person is showing up in, in this correspondence and this correspondence and this correspondence, and although very few people have written about them, uh, they wind up being particularly crucial. Uh, those, those certainly have cropped up, but I think more important for me is I've been able to use networks as an uh, explanatory mechanism for historical arguments. So for example, I'm interested in why certain types of scientific or scholarly endeavors uh, are fostered in one period versus another period. For example, 
in the mid 1600s, uh, uh, attempts started at, at global or at least international meteorological surveys uh, starting from Western Europe and they largely failed and they succeeded about a hundred years later. Why is that? Well, I've been able to show through networks, uh, through network analysis that there's this uh, kind of calcification of institutional networks that needed to exist before you could have um, uh, observational conduits that allowed, um, allowed a lot of people to coordinate a lot of data uh, from all over the world um, and then re-aggregate them together and be able to make some claims about you know, global weather or zoology or whatever particular uh, scientific endeavor is, is being undertaken. And networks I have found to be a network analysis, a uh, particularly useful way of uh, both making those explanations and uh, making finer detail um, explanations than we have been able to in the past. Uh, thank you for those wonderful answers. Uh, according to our schedule, this is now the time where we have a few minute coffee break, um, or we might, if you guys are still interested in taking a short break to kind of refresh tea, whatever coffee, whatever you're drinking today, um, then we're gonna kind of move into your guys' position statements. So um, really we wanna kind of uh, take this wonderful collaboration you've built and put the uh, amount of tension we can on it, uh, just to show how truly close you guys have uh, become in the process of writing this book. Um, but yeah, thoughts, take a short break or jump into your guys' position statements. And I'll just note that there are four open questions on the Q&A, uh, which you can are welcome to engage live or answer. You can also answer by typing uh, if you want to take time for live, live, further live questions. Uh, members of the audience, once more, if you turned in late, we have an open Q&A box. You are welcome to use that to submit questions to the authors. We have a variety of nice questions already about collaboration and teaching and specific domains of interest. Uh, Ruth, what do you think? Do you wanna go for it? I'm happy to push through. Okay. All right. I have half a couple of left. Um, I know people have to leave on the dot at five, so that would be great. If you don't mind, everyone. Makes sense, let's go on ahead. Ruth, are you willing to start us off with your position paper? I think mine might respond to someone else's a little bit. So should we go in the order that's in the Google Doc? Is that all right? I think let's do that. <laughs> uh, which I believe means that I'm starting out. Okay. Um, and I think that Nicole might be uh, uh, fruitfully ripping off of mine. So I think this will be perfect. Uh, so I guess to start, I'll quote uh, Ernest Hemingway out of context, uh, which is to say, networks happened gradually, then suddenly. Um, the 21st century turn was so sudden and forceful, in fact, that it kind of created its own gravity. Um, writing on the commercial successes of uh, the internet and Google and Facebook on the one hand, um, and on the aesthetic and intellectual successes of network methodologies on the other hand, uh, we started using network-shaped cookie cutters uh, at every opportunity. Uh, and so suddenly everything got stuffed into networks all at once, even the things that didn't quite fit. Uh, this phenomenon uh, became a self-reinforcing positive feedback loop. Uh, so bending the structures of the world uh, into networks, which themselves begat even more networks. Um, the disadvantaged um, among the world uh, initially used this sudden shift uh, to challenge uh, hierarchical hegemony, uh, as with uh, Occupy Wall Street or the Iranian Green Movement uh, and others. Um, however, those in power quickly learned how to wield networks themselves uh, through targeted political advertising, um, puppeteered populism, and other means of distributed control. Uh, networks became the tool for both breaking and reinforcing power in the early 21st century. Uh, so my provocation then, uh, echoed from our book, is that uh, we must engage with the network turn not only because it would be irresponsible not to, true though that might be, but also because at this point it would be impossible not to. And I will let Nicole take it away. Very nice, Scott. Uh,
you know, I've been, I've been um, uh, uh, trying to, I guess, push forward this notion for quite some time now um, that data is a medium. So data, you know, this information that's underlying uh, the networks. And when I say um, is a medium, what I mean by that is um, it's incredibly fungible. It's really a matter of how we choose to shape it and construct it. Um, I think networks are an extraordinarily um, helpful form uh, for, for being able to navigate and shape that you know, precisely because uh, particularly if we think in terms of um, visualization, the, well, the fact that that we can think of networks in this completely abstract um, sort of numerical way or in terms of visualization, right? And that there's, um, there isn't a set form uh, and we, um, in other words, the way they, you know, a visual network fills up a, a space um, can shift and change and be reoriented, um, that we're having to be constantly aware of the fact that we're looking at a two-dimensional representation of this thing, but in fact, you know, in our minds, we know that uh, it can be multi-dimensional. Um, that gives it um, a, a quality of um, enhancing our imagination, um, our ability to, to kind of think a bit beyond uh, and, and continue to, 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 um, to be, to take a sort of critical stance. Um, and so it's interesting because I'm, I'm often, you know, considered or, you know, described as a, as a technologist. Uh, and yet I, I tend to um, push back more and more on the, um, the, the, the network analysis, you know, um, approach to how we use networks and not because I don't think that's extraordinary, really powerful tool for us to use, but just that it's a complementary tool. Um, and uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, you know, in, first it's about um, really coming to terms with what's the data that's underlying this and now then how am I going to sort of shape my, uh, a particular point of view or argument with it. Um, so I, I'm going to inc incorporate into this position statement. So um, actually, one of the, the um, questions here from I hope I'm pronouncing this right, um, Janelle Gertz. Uh, so the question was about um, how network analysis helps us address questions of gender, race, and sexuality. Uh, now, you know, I, I, I guess the response would be in line with what I was saying. You know, the network doesn't do that. <laughs> at all, um, we do that. But it's quite interesting to see, for example, um, students, you know, graduate students I was working with, have they changed their research questions because of the possibilities of the network by starting to think of things instead of as lists in terms of their connections, got them to be, to push outside and see, well, what are the connections that I'm not seeing? How can I continue to grow this? Because it can move in so many different directions. Um, it's it's a form that um, enables us to, you know, as I said, saying sort of think a bit more um, flexibly. Flexibly, the 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 provocation that I had written about was um, that that Ruth was going to respond to was that I feel like this notion of of networks and the importance of networks is sort of falling away. And I I didn't I think that was a I don't know, somehow misstated. I, it wasn't, that's not in fact how I feel, but I guess I, I work now within a context at an institution that um, uh, really, really is putting all of their, 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 their money and resources into artificial intelligence, right? Um, and the, the systems kind of um, thinking, looking for intelligent systems and ways that we can build this. And I, I see a danger there um, that uh, networks are not um, part, enough part of the conversation. It's starting to come in, bringing in the power of knowledge graphs. Um, but really, I think this is, it's very timely, in fact, for us to be bringing this issue back you know, to, to the fore and recognizing that it's, it, all of those systems are driven by data and therefore um, understanding the connectedness and this rich connectedness of data and being able to critically approach that and really see what's in there and what's not. Um, those are the tools that we need. Um, but then the tools are, you know, 
put in the hands of the individuals who are going to, to, to be accountable to make their decisions. So Ruth. Yeah. Thanks, Nicole. So the, <laughs> the, the point I was gonna make, my little uh, kind of point I want to make to start conversation off is um, maybe the metaphor is falling away, but I think that methodolo methodology and framework of network analysis is still key. And I actually think we've still yet to see the full potential of what the network framework can offer to the analysis of cultural heritage data. So once collections are more systematically linked, um, I think network analysis has huge potential to allow us to see the relations between people, between places, between collections and between archives that have been hidden by the siloing of data. And I think that actually comes back to Janelle's question as well, because I think those people who have been rendered marginal in standard collections of historical data might start to emerge as important as people who intersect between collections of data. So um, I think that's a really important onus that's placed on us to understand what these methods can help us do to um, recenter the marginalized. Um, yeah, so um, my, my provocation actually fits nicely uh, with Nicole's in a, in a sense, because what I, uh, what I want to reflect on is, is, why, is why are networks such a, a, an interdisciplinary tool and um, I've, I've thought about this for a long time because I've done uh, I've worked in network analysis for some time and when I go to networks conference I, I, I you know you can go to one room and hear a talk on Twitter and the next room will have a talk on brains or or regulatory networks in biology or transport networks and um, or the humanities in fact and and uh, I thought why, why is this and it's exactly because of what Nicole touched upon which is that I have a knowledge is, is can be represented in, in network form as in as Nicole said network uh, knowledge graphs so and a fairly new kind of database format which which people try to represent almost everything and 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 so networks actually the networks that we study in network analysis are just kind of flattened simplifications of that knowledge graph in a sense and it's actually very difficult to formalize that knowledge graph which is exactly what AI is trying to do to some extent AI research um, but it is also the reason, you know, because we're the networks that we study in all these disciplines are just uh, projections of that higher order um, network of knowledge. So uh, at least that's sort of uh, that, that would be my provocation. And and so so that's why networks are such a unique tool that keeps popping up everywhere. And that's their potential. But it's also, uh, as Scott said, um, you know, networks aren't always appropriate. And I think it's because those simplifications aren't always maybe done in the right way, or, or there's oversimplifications or or, you know, you can you can project project things in unhelpful ways that obscure things. So um, they're not all powerful, but they are ubiquitous for those reasons. I think so. Um, that that's my provocation. Thank you for these. These were wonderful. And uh, if anybody wants to reply in the Q and A uh, or have questions about these provocations, or you can go to the book because a lot of these are in there as well. Um, so we already have a series of great questions um, and you, I think you guys kind of uh, answered Janelle's already. So I think next we're gonna go to Matt Lincoln who I think is directly responding to a lot of what you guys are saying and also talking um, about the section of the book that we haven't really gotten into yet. Um, so he, um, I'm gonna read it out fully. He says, uh, Nicole brings out something I've often observed in historical network workshops. Many researchers find the most valuable um, and discovery from the process of thinking uh, through how to construct their data, never needing to actually use the more complex computational affordances of networks as explanatory methods that Scott just described. Uh, you talk a bit about this in Maneuvers, which is the final section. What are your hope or hopes for how this book will help future humanistic networkers research, uh, researchers navigate this uh, foci of network analysis? Big question. <laughs> That's really great. I, I think you guys, you know, you have a lot in this final section where you talk about the different ways of scales of analysis and interpretation that networks um, enables. Uh, do you have kind of, yeah, a sense of the this future direction you're trying to, to push humanists towards? I mean, the, the subtitle is changing perspectives in the humanities. So you're, you're certainly not shy about <laughs> who you're trying well, to influence. <laughs> I think one of the things that we want to do is suggest that 
Um, we suggest that you want to orient yourself to your data in a way that might be able to move across methods that would normally be associated with different fields of, or disciplines. And you might want to move from a very quantitative overview down to a close reading, but from that iterate up to something that gives you a, a meso scale analysis because you're trying to model something at a kind of local level. Um, and I think we just want to lay out a set of steps you might go through that are thought processes that might help you aid discovery. And also think really consciously about what combination of those maneuvers you might want for a specific venue, a publication venue, because you don't want necessarily all of those kind of moves you can pull in every kind of venue. And something for a history journal might be very different for something you want to, um, to say in a digital humanities journal. Um, and so it depends what kind of audience you're approaching. You might want to say something altogether different if you're aiming at a science crowd and want to say something about the structure of knowledge over the whole of the uh, 19th and 20th centuries. So we wanted to get people just to step back and think about what kind of analysis is right for the, the situation. What level of abstraction and what, what's the trade-off if you have more abstraction then you, then you have more powerful analysis but you, you throw away more data so uh, which for some research questions might be fine but for others not so it's, it's I think to raise, raise that awareness and that's you know, defining your entities that you that correspond to your nodes and relationships is actually a, a very humanities type of enterprise that in the sciences is often people start with the data and 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 don't think as much about that process of turning the, the real world into data and so that's um i think that's more important in the humanities it should be more important in data should, science. should also be yeah, more yeah. important in the sciences <laughs> and the, the sciences can learn a lot from the humanities in this respect. Yeah. Reading your book again, I was struck by your discussion of scale, of network analysis as something as a form of analysis that allows you to move from micro networks around individuals and their lives and ideas to macro portraits of the whole. And I think you know, as Sebastian is saying, this really um, this really gets at a kind of inquiry that marries humanistic concern about individuals and context and small communities with macroscopic social science concern about what does the whole look like and it's mediated through you know a very rigorous set of measurements which then allow you to say oh but I picked up this individual this one conspirator or this network of conspirators and then to treat them with humanistic concern in a way that you can prove is relevant to the whole. And I think, you know, for my money, that's, it, that's a kind of analysis that answers a lot of deep fundamental questions of the kind that Nicole was pointing at about the future of analysis in a university where, where information science is getting a lot of money and the humanities are getting less money. And also the kind of political analysis that Scott was putting on the table uh, where, where um, we, we've sometimes been really excited about the Arab Spring and Occupy and people to people transactions, taking into account critically their political and economic context, but network analysis has sometimes appeared in the guise of the thing that the state is gonna use to find the terrorist or suppress the activist top-down power. So I, I really appreciate them. part of the message of this book is that you can move between scales and moving in between scales, you can preserve the humanist's attention to individuals, resistance, context, uh, dissent, agency, all of those things that humanists really care about when they're thinking about what makes for a healthy city or where innovation um, or in the sense of uh, movements for civil rights come from in the past. You can preserve those things while being rigorous in your analysis. Um, and maybe, maybe a question that comes out for me from that is, you know, if you imagined a future kind of a university where people are doing this work that moves between science and the humanities and moves between scales, and, collaborations between information scientists and, uh, and uh, tutor literary scholars become the rule. Um, what kind of things would those people be doing? Who would they serve? Would they be working for the CIA? What would they do for society? What's the big picture future of this kind of analysis?
I, can I, I want to just respond to that um, and, and, you know, following on with Matt's um, question. I, it's interesting, I all along in this book wasn't thinking so much about speaking to, to humanists as much as speaking across disciplines. Uh, and, and in a sense, you know, hopefully being able to reach, um, you know, others perhaps, for example, in data science who are already thinking and using network and using network analysis, but maybe not thinking about it in the way um, that humanists approach it. Uh, and so it's, uh, I, I hope, um, empowering to, to humans who are just interested and seeing the possibilities, but also um, informative, um, just as, uh, as both you know, Ruth and Seb were saying about how data science, at least as it is taught, is a, little, is a bit impoverished in, in the sense of thinking about um, the nature and the, in the richness of the, of the potential connections. Um, Joe participated in a conference um, that we hosted recently. At, it was a collaboration between SESTA and the Data Science Institute at Stanford. Um, and we had a follow-up you know, challenge with, with students and, and you know, one of the um, graduate students from data science working in collaboration with the humanists was saying, I found it really fascinating that, um, you know, that, that humanists think as much about interpretation as method. Um, and, you know, that was a, that was really uh, called out as a sort of dramatic insight. And, and I, you know, so that's the kind of thing, I guess, I hope, you know, with this book that it can, it can speak across different disciplines, but sort of inject more of, there's always interpretation going on, let's foreground that. Absolutely. That's great. Um, we have a number of questions and we have six minutes left. So I kind of want to try and combine as much as possible. Um, uh, Sergio um, and Simon both kind of asked similar questions, uh, which is about kind of the construction of data sets. And one thing I remember in the books, Ruth and Sebastian, you mentioned that it took 18 months to do the kind of data work, the data cleaning, the data munging of your uh, tutor um, networks project. Um, so is there anything you would want to add of kind of how this book is talking about building your data sets? I mean, a lot of this is in the book itself, if you guys, uh, especially kind of um, chapter three, um, but what strategies, if any, that you've kind of developed for uh, gathering data set and kind of related to Simon's question, what are the kind of, um, privacy and ethical issues uh, that are starting to be raised with this. And this is kind of getting to the broader question about kind of power dynamics with networks today that Joe already raised. We don't have um, so much privacy issues because we're working with people who have been dead for 500 years. So that makes it a little bit easier for us. And someone else might be able to speak to that better than me because most of my people are long dead. Um, that, that long data cleaning process was partly because we decided to take an assisted manual approach. So Sebastian built tools for data cleaning that assisted me to make humanistic person-by-person -person decisions about whether two historical human beings were the same person or multiple human beings. And, um, and for us, we knew that, that we needed to do that if we wanted to speak to a history crowd, because whenever we presented it to people who were data scientists, they're like, well, you could probably like automate that. And it would probably be like 90% effective. We're like, well, 90% effective doesn't persuade our historian crowd. So we made that decision to put that labor in. Um, and for us, when we published the book, the data set we will publish with it because of the huge amount of labor went into that, not just by me, but by um, some research associates, um, including a lot of thinkers who I think is on this call. Um, and, and the tools that came out of that as well, we wanna share the tools so that people can also um, do that kind of work in a manual assisted way. Yeah, my, my, so yeah, I think we, we, we... I think that a semi-automated approach is, is best there. And that's sort of, is again, a, a sort of bit like this iterative back and forth that you, the machine suggests stuff, but you have to verify validate it, it, validate it. And in some cases, you know, um, dig deeper in, but but you can accelerate a lot of these things with with the help of algorithms. Um, so so um, I think that's what we found is, is, is the best approach. Should we try and get to another question before mm. time runs out? <laughs> Joe, do you want to select one? I, I, any? 
Uh, sure. You've got a lot of congratulations. There are some people who are curious about footnote 40. Let me encourage some of the authors to respond to that. Uh, Scott, you should take that one. Um, yes, Scott's footnote. Yeah, you want to do that one. There's also, a, uh, let me just point out, there's an inquiry from Markman Ellis about Ruth's story hunting and how that's worked out. You know, the beautiful thing about having this Q&A box is that we can potentially have a couple of you typing while one of you is talking. Uh, how the, the ableism, we have an inquiry from Princeton about ableism in data science. Um, uh, and I think that's, am I missing anything, Zoe? No, I think that's pretty, pretty comprehensive, yeah. Okay. You wanna take footnote 40, it's pretty juicy. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump into that first and very briefly. Uh, thank you, Isabel. Um, so I basically have uh, was doing a sort of my own history of social network analysis a few years ago and found that the um, uh, the majority of people in my Zotero library uh, were either um, women who were working at uh, teaching universities, um, uh, often uh, related to psychology because it was related to sociograms and, and Moreno and Helen Hall Jennings. Um, and also people of color who were doing uh, anthropologies of um, uh, um, largely uh, black and African-American communities. Um, as far as I know, this is not a story that's really been told anywhere, um, but it, it was also not the place in this very slim volume to tell it. Um, we have no particular plans to pursue this further, but please, that this I suppose is my own provocation, please somebody take that up because I would love to, to, to learn more about that story and I think it's one that needs to be told. All right, uh, I guess we are at, at time. We are at the top of the hour. So now is the time for everyone to thank the authors for sharing this book with us. Congratulations. Uh, for bringing this beautiful book into the world. Uh, good luck to everybody who's teaching it. Stay in touch. Thanks to Cambridge University Press. Congratulations to Laura and Samantha for bringing this new publication into being. Your, your series is well launched and we look forward to seeing more from the Element series. Uh, shall, shall I say that um, if, you, if you are also a brilliant digital humanist and have ideas, you should probably submit a book proposal to Lara and Samantha so that they can give you a beautiful Zoom book launch and a beautiful publication of the kind that we've just seen. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Thank you, thank you.